Good morning and happy Sabbath. Yeah, we thank God for this day that He's brought us into His church again. And uh, we're going to have the health nugget, just a brief outlook on the series that we've been doing on uh, reproductive cancers. And before we go on, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath that you've given us. We glorify your name because you are gracious and marvelous. We thank you for bringing us into your household and even for those who are listening online. We pray for special blessings that our being here shall indeed rejuvenate us, revive us, and make us ready even for your second coming. And I pray that may the message that will come through this presentation be of use to your people, that we shall be able to take the measures that are pertinent so that we continue to foster good health in our communities. Because we are praying, trusting, and believing in Jesus' name. Uh, so to begin with, my name is uh, Dr. Rael Mutai. I'm a member of this church. And I'm standing in for a uh, visiting guest who was supposed to come in today. His name is Dr. Mokomba of Kenyatta National Hospital. He's not able to come, but we hope that he will get time, perhaps in the course of the month, to come and make a presentation on an area that we think is very relevant to reproductive health, more so the issues of cancers of the reproductive uh, tract. And specifically, he will look at the clinical dimensions what they are able to do, what uh, the members of the community are supposed to do so that we make the cases of these reproductive uh, tract cancers less and less and eventually be able to bring them to zero. So um, for the purpose of this presentation, I think I want to re-emphasize that January was the month, uh, was the cervical, awareness, uh, cervical cancer awareness month and I think we've had two already presentations on the same, and we continue to make a few more presentations because we think it is important. In as much as we are already in February, and there is so much going on in February, it is always important to remember that January is the Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. And during that time, this is when we have all the campaigns encouraging women to go for screening, to take the tests, you know, and to, you know, and even for governments and other partners to be able to scale up the interventions that will make sure that the numbers uh, will significantly reduce in the population. I don't know if the people in the communication are able to screen the presentation, but if not, we shall uh, proceed because I cannot see it as yet. So uh, what I can say is that Cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable types of cancers. This is information that is in the public domain. But this issue remains a public health concern. The reason being, like for instance in the year 2020, there were 600,000 newly diagnosed cases of cervical cancer across the world. And out of that, about 342,000 women, meaning that from the many cases that were there, a whole 342,000 women across the world died from cervical cancer. And therefore, that is quite significant because those of you who may have some, uh, some public health information, you will know that uh, we always say that the burden of maternal mortality remains big in the world because on average, 300,000 women die annually from pregnancy and pregnancy-related complications, things around childbirth and the likes. That is just 300,000. But we are saying that cervical cancer killed, on average, 342,000 women, which is really quite significant, and especially given that the means to prevent it, the means to treat it, are already available all over the place. Now, the question is, why, uh, apart from that data, what we can also say about cervical cancer is that more than 85% of the cases that are of the, of, the, of the women that are dying of cervical cancer, these people are in the developing world, we, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, data from 2020 shows that Kenya was ranked number 20 among the countries with the highest burden of cervical cancer, meaning that the cases that were recorded, the women that died from cervical cancer in our own country is quite significant that all of us should give it a thought, consider even as we think of the many other things. And what are the reasons for this situation? The reason for this situation are very simple things, nothing major, because it says it's because of lack of access to primary health care. Primary health care is being able to access a health center, being able to access a dispensary, being able to, 
to access what is called a primary hospital, a sub-county hospital, a district hospital, and have a, a conversation with a clinician so that they are able to screen you if you are supposed to be screened or give you the vaccination for those who are eligible, which I will tell you who is eligible. And for those who are diagnosed, there are also measures that can be implemented to make sure that the disease does not progress and their lives can be saved. And uh, what is notable is that over the last 30 years, that is all the way from 1990 to, 90, uh, to 2020, the burden of uh, cervical cancer mortality has not changed at all. It seems, you know, so much is happening, maybe so little in other places, but overall, the numbers don't seem to have changed over 30 years, meaning that this really remains an issue that uh, calls for the attention of all people. So what we know is that uh, more than 99% of the cases of cervical cancer are caused by infection with, with the human papilloma virus. This is a sexually transmitted virus. It is very common in the community. And you know, it is the virus 16, number 16 and, and 18 that are really associated with, the, uh, that have been known to cause cervical cancer. There are many types of uh, HPV viruses. And for those, uh, vi uh, those two viruses are if effectively controlled by the vaccines that are available. There are actually three types of vaccines in the market that available to be given and normally it is given to boys and girls age 10 to 14 those who are not yet uh, sexually exposed they are not sexually active meaning that it, the role is to prevent any possibility of exposure to HPV in the future and therefore protect them from the possibility of developing um, uh, cervical cancer uh, in addition to exposure to HPV, which, is a direct uh, which has a direct link, other factors that play a role in causation of cervical cancer is uh, the se normally we, lay, we say the sexual history. People who have early sexual debut, people who have multiple sexual partners, people who have high-risk partners. So you could be a, a low risk yourself, but if your partner is having multiple partners, then you become at a, you are at risk of contracting uh, HPV and therefore cervical cancer uh, increases with time. Uh, the other factor is HIV. Uh, data shows that any woman who is HIV positive is six times more likely to, to develop cervical cancer compared to somebody else who is HIV negative. Then there is smoking, which may not be a big issue in this part of the world, but of course in the developed countries, many women who present with cervical cancer have a history of smoking. There is chlamydia infection, a common uh, infection in women, and uh, it also affects men, and it is associated with cervical cancer. The issues of poverty and uh, low education, low access to health services, which tend to affect affect marginalized communities, communities in rural setup, people in informal settlement, people who are just in very remote places and therefore cannot access health care are at an increased uh, risk of, uh, of, of, of cervical cancer. The other factor is long-term use of oral contraceptives, an association has been demonstrated, a diet low in fruits and vegetables, and of course, finally, there is the issue of sexual violence, which also plays a critical role in the transmission of sexual uh, transmitted diseases, including HPV, and therefore increase uh, the risk for cervical cancer. So looking at that list, all these factors are basically amenable. All these things can be modified and therefore uh, reduce the possibility of uh, women presenting with cervical cancer. So uh, what is known is that from the public health uh, point of view, is that the absence of vaccination programs for HPV, the absence of screening for women who are sexually active, anybody who has had history of valvular, vaginal uh, lesion, immunosuppression, and cigarette smoking, generally are considered the factors that increase the possibility of one having a cervical cancer. And we know that in many high-income countries, cervical cancer is actually rare. The same way maternal uh, deaths are very rare in, uh, during delivery. You know, you, the disparity is so clear that you can find a place like Kenya where maternal mortality is said to be 362 women per 100,000 deliveries. Of course, in the developed countries, it is not even five. Men, some countries are actually actually almost at zero. So in the same way, we find that almost 90% of cases and more than 90% of deaths associated with cervical cancer occur in the developing world. And as I say, the studies from Ethiopia, studies from Kenya, 
all of them show that one of the underlying factors is even the knowledge, attitude, and the practices of women around cervical cancer. Very few women, maybe up to uh, 50%, sometimes they are not even aware that they are supposed to have a pap smear, and they have even never gone for a pap smear, and they cannot just see the association between uh, a pap smear and cervical cancer. And that is why many of them will present uh, very late. Um, in Kenya, the statistics show that uh, cervical cancer is the second most common cancer in women for after breast cancer. And in 2020, there were 5,200 new cases. Not only that, but out of that, there were an, uh, the women who died from cervical cancer was 3,211, which is really significant. Because if you compare the people who have died from COVID since... Uh, uh, 2020 to 2022, it was, we are still at around 6,000 and something. But this was just the number of women who died from cervical cancer in one year, 3,211. I think that is something that all of us, uh, it makes all of us uh, rethink what we do uh, about it. And then, um, so then what can we do for, in terms of prevention, the measures that have been uh, globally approved for use across the world is the HPV vaccine. And I just want to tell you that this vaccine is for girls and boys. The government program, I know the, the vaccine was launched in Kenya about three years ago, and it was mainly targeting girls uh, of 10 years in primary school. But of course, all girls 10 to 14 years are eligible. Even boys uh, should be given that vaccine because this vaccine really protects against cervical cancer in the long run. Secondly is screening for precancerous lesions. So all women above 30 years, as long as you're sexually active, you should have your <coughs> pap smear, the, you can have visual ins inspection of the cervix, you can have uh, the HPV DNA tests. All these uh, measures are readily available in public and in private setup, and therefore you should have it. Actually, the WHO recommendation is that anybody between 30 to 49 at the least should have one pap smear. And uh, we normally encourage that during the cervical cancer month of January, you should at least strive to get your pap smear done. And if not, maybe you set for yourself another reminder. Maybe you can say during your birthday, you know, you can also give to your sister, your aunt, your mother, and any, any other uh, lady in your family by ensuring that you can pay for them or get them to get a pap smear. And that will really save life because it will pick out any possibility, any changes that may be taking place in the cervix so that it can be treated early, early enough and make sure that they do not uh, progress to end stage uh, cervical cancer. And then, of course, we know that there is treatment that is available and especially if it is picked early. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, cervical cancer is highly preventable. Unlike other cancers where we struggle to say we do not know the cause, we do not know what we can modify, but in cervical, matter cervical cancer, it is highly preventable and it is treatable if it is picked early. So in other words, we are saying we are encouraging the public, the women population, to go for screening, take up your screening, the pap smears when they are available, you know, during the campaigns and wherever, please don't miss out on those opportunities. And then for children 10 to 14, girls and boys, they should be vaccinated against the HPV. Let them take the vaccination. It will protect and save their lives. And of course, let us also share the information because there are many people who are not informed and therefore cannot make decisions. People are only able to take action when they understand the implication and how it all goes about. So thank you very much for listening and may God bless us. May we become the ambassadors and campaign to make sure that all women are protected from cervical cancer because it is preventable, it is treatable. Thank you very much.